welcome to episode 11 of 13 Moons, 13 Reads. Uh, my name is David Bouchard. I am a Métis from Saskatchewan, uh, living in British Columbia. And uh, we are going into a new moon, and this is, this is really, really exciting. I'm going to get a chance to speak with and uh, introduce you to Michael Hutchison and talk about a character with depth of knowledge and experience and yet a young man. So uh, this is particularly interesting for me. Oh, let me say very quickly, if I didn't say it earlier, uh, we uh, are, are doing this uh, through Good Minds. And Good Minds are the largest distributor uh, in the world of Indigenous products. So this is a, a real, a real coup for us, uh, for me as a, as an author, as an Indigenous person. So uh, we are now in the middle of Indigenous Peoples Aware Awareness Month, and that makes it that much more special. Uh, and that I'll be speaking to to Michael. Uh, but before we even go there, um, Debbie Beach Ducharme is here to tell us about the new moon. It's the Frost Moon. Uh, and she is Anishinaabek uh, uh, educator from Treaty 2 territory, also known as Dog Creek First Nation. Uh, she will enlighten and inform all of us now. Take it away, Debbie. Hi, Lynn, again. My name is Deborah Beach Ducharme, and today we'll be discussing the 11th moon. And the 11th moon is the frost moon. Uh, in our language, we say Kashik Dine, or we can say Kashik Kashik Dine Isis. And that is the frost moon. And the reason this is this month is considered the frost moon is because it's the frost is starting to make an appearance on the land. It's another sign that things are changing. All Mother Earth's creatures and plant life are resting for the winter and for the moons ahead. So that's why you will see different, you'll see different things happening on the land and you'll hear different things happening. And this is how the creatures and plant life uh, begin to rest for the winter moons ahead. Miigwech. So we're very pleased at, uh, at Good Minds this morning to have, uh, have a chance to talk to Michael. Um, Michael is um, Michael Hutchison is a citizen of the, and Michael, you'll help me, different pronunciations, but uh, Mystic Cree Nation, that's yep. Treaty 5 territory. And um, to our listeners and viewers, you'll have to hang on for a second because there's a, there's a substantial um, background that I think most of it deserves merits uh, reading. Uh, he's worked as a journalist at the Calgary Strait, the Aboriginal Times, staff writer for the Indian Claims Commission in Ottawa, and was the director of communications for the Assembly of Manitoba Chiefs. He was a project manager for the, project manager for the uh, Treaty Relations Commission of Manitoba, where he helped create the We Are All Treaty People that most educators are aware of. And if, we're, if you're not uh, friends, please take a, take a minute and look it up. Uh, campaign, as was communication. Uh, he was a communications officer of the Assembly of First Nations. He's been the host of APTN's National News and produced APTN's sit down interview sh show face to face that again, most of you've probably seen and if you've not, it's, it's, it's something you will want to look up. Uh, and APTN's version of politically incorrect, the laughing drum. More recently, Michael worked uh, for the Assembly of First Nations in Manitoba, Kiwatinawi, uh, Okima Kanak. Yes. And um, he's currently a co-host on CTV's morning uh, a live Winnipeg show. And among all of that, he's found the time to be the father of two daughters, authored three titles in tremendously successful uh, popular uh, series of Mighty Muskrats, a young adult mystery series. And whoa, um, you know, where do you go from that? Uh, just to, Michael, if you'll allow me, I've kind of put some questions together here from some of our readers. Okay. And let me let me start. Is the, did I miss anything in that 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 vast introduction? Uh, uh, well, I, I guess uh, you know I'm older than I look, and uh, I, I started working at a young age. I, I started working when I was probably about twelve or thirteen. So uh, so yeah, I've had I've had a good fortune uh, to work in a lot of places. I'm somebody who believes in learning uh, trial by fire. I guess. Yeah. And yeah. so. Uh, uh, and I'm always somebody who who likes to help. I grew up kind of on a farm, so there's no job too small. And um, and through that, uh, sort of those two philosophies put together, I guess, uh, uh, opportunity has just kind of fallen in my uh, in my bowl, so to speak. And uh, I've been very lucky throughout my life. 
Uh, other jobs I've done, you know, the favorite, probably the most favorite job I ever did was when I was a young man. Uh, my mom actually had to lie about my age so I could do the job. Uh, I was a forest firefighter in, in Manitoba for, um, you know, probably between the ages of uh, 15 and 19, I guess, around. And uh, I also, uh, in my early 20s, I worked for a catering co uh, company and we did catering for rock concerts and movie shoots. So uh, in the early 90s, I did uh, uh, a lot of the dressing rooms uh, for the bands that came through Winnipeg, uh, like the Rolling Stones, Pink Floyd, Metallica, Tina Turner. Totally. Uh, how so, cool yeah, would that be? Oh, it was a great job. It was a great job. And um, yeah, and so I've been very lucky. You know, there's something to that. And, for, you know, a lot of times people say, well, yeah, I haven't been dealt a fair hand. And I've got to say, being older now, it's true. Some, some of us get uh, more breaks than others. And uh, we are, we're grateful and we, we're thankful. Um, so let's go back to the farm. You grew up in a farm in, in Ontario? No, uh, in, in Manitoba. In Manitoba. Uh, yeah. You know, I say I have two hometowns, like uh, Mississippoistic is up north in Treaty yeah. 5 territory. Yeah. And then um, and then my parents, you know, the education system wasn't very good up there uh, when I yeah. was a young, a young kid. So they brought us down south. My dad bought a farm, being my dad, he bought a, a piece of land in the middle of nowhere. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, it was just a piece of land. So we eventually built a house. Everything that's on that farm was built by uh, our family, I guess you could say. Wow. And... Um, and uh, yeah, so we weren't very rich for, uh, you know, well, you know, as my dad's career went on, we, we got uh, better off. But uh, for a time, uh, you know, say between the ages of seven and 14, uh, we lived, there's 10 of us living in a two bedroom farmhouse. And uh, uh, in the summer times, me and my brothers would go sleep in the hayloft of the barn um, to, uh, you know, just to put, give, give the family more room. So I was one of the few kids growing up that had the clear, uh, barn swallow poop off his forehead before he went to school <laughs> and you can remember the smell yes well and people say you know did you ever grow up in a barn and or you know what did you grow up in a barn and it's like well we <laughs> got a bit more yeah, summer that's Edward. right <laughs> how, how are your siblings doing big family like that are, are they all are they all right yeah yeah all my siblings are successful people you know my mom and dad uh were always uh you know my grandparents you know i owe it all to my grandparents as well who were always people who were you know you get a job you uh you contribute to the family uh, you yeah. know you make certain that you're you you're capable of helping others and yeah. um and you know and that and so uh you know and that trickled down through my parents and all that kind of stuff so yeah uh started working at a young age well you were you were lucky to have mom and dad so many so many uh, indigenous youth grew up with grandma and grandpa and uh residential schools said uh, untaught love, uh, love from families. And so many parents struggled as uh, in loving their kids because they just didn't witness it. They never experienced it. So you were lucky that way. Yes, I would have to say, uh, you know, uh, my stepdad, you know, I don't really call him stepdad. He's my dad. Uh, yep. he's, he's a Hutchison? Fact. Yes, yes. Uh, that's his, that's his last name. Yeah. Um, and, um, and yeah, and my mom, uh, you know, both did a great job. They were, they're great people. And uh, yeah, love them both. Yeah. And is she still here, your mom? Uh, yes. Yep. Yep. Still uh, on the farm. On the farm. No kidding. Yeah. Oh, you've got to like that. Yes, for sure. Um, tell me, tell me about your indigenous roots. Ojibwe background? No, I'm Cree, uh, Swampy Cree from uh, Mississippiistic. Uh, yep. Our uh, community, you know, was the first, well, if you look at a map of Manitoba, you can see the Great Big Lake. And then there's the, uh, there's the North Saskatchewan River that, yeah. that comes from the Rockies into the lake. And, uh, you know, so our reserve was very important to, um, you know, our, our traditional territory was very important to the fur trade. And so the first railway lines in Western Canada were laid on my First Nation. Uh, they carried goods from, from uh, the, the top of the falls to the bottom of the falls and back and forth. Mm -hmm. And, you know, my family uh, prior to that and even after carried goods up in there, uh, sometimes on their backs and, and then a lot of times on York boats and that sort of thing. But we are misopoistic means basically big sounding waters and um, um, big thunder waters, I guess you could also say. And uh, uh, what happened was in the 1950s, uh, Manitoba Hydro built a dam on our waters. And so now they're silent. And so the elders always speak about missing that sound, you mm -hmm. know, uh, because they used to say that they would hear the sound of the ancestors, you know, in in the rapids and in the, in the noise of the rapids and now now they're silent oh, so that's where i'm from are you and, kind of uh, parallel with norway house uh norway house is a little bit north of us yeah uh you know and um 
you know, that and, and importance that, you know, I said before about the importance of the fur trade, you know, areas that were more important to the European economy, you could say that those First Nations were squeezed a little bit more yeah. than people, you know, so there were, there were some First Nations whose relationship with sort of, you know, Europeans in Canada is all about control, control, while some other ones who are in other areas that are not so important to the European economy or the Canadian economy, their sort of relationship is defined by neglect. <laughs> and so, uh, so you know, ours was a, a very controlled relationship because of the, the importance of our land to the fur trade. And, uh, you know, that's one of the reasons there's like eight churches on our reserve, you know. Our father who aren't in heaven. <laughs> yes, we, well. <laughs> we've lived in spite of it. Go ahead. Say yeah. It. Yeah. Um, you know, now, how does a guy go from, obviously, from the reserve to a farm to the, the extensive political life that you've lived? Is that through training or through just good fortune, meeting someone? I mean, you've been involved with so many uh, major, major Indigenous uh, stepping stones. Yeah, well, you know, uh, the way to be a good person in my culture is yeah. to, uh, you know, find your talent. Everybody's given a talent, that, a, you know, uh, through, through creation. Yeah. and. Uh, um, and to, to turn that to the good of your community. Now, yeah. in, in high school, you know, I was kind of an angry young man and I, I got kicked out of band class because I kept making the teacher cry. But uh, they put me in a, a, a class called Enriched Fundamentals, which is basically they put the toughest teacher in school at the front <laughs> of the that, class. Right. And they gave us, a, you know, a stack of full scap. And he just said, you know, write something or draw yeah. something. I don't know. Just be quiet for the next hour. <laughs> you know, yeah. and, uh, and that was basically what they did with us. So uh, so I started writing um, and my dad, uh, you know, he hated TV when we were young. So we would only get fuzzy CBC. And if that if that. And so. Uh, and sometimes he removed the TV for whole seasons. So I read a lot. And so between those two things, uh, you know, I developed a talent for writing. And, uh, you know, and that's in that enriched fundamental class in grade 10 after I got kicked out of band. That's when I started learning or people started telling me, you know, uh, apparently you can write. Or, or, this you is your write. gift. Yeah. And so, um, so and then, you know, I took journalism courses and all that kind of stuff. I uh, yeah. got into journalism. And then, you know, I moved over to the communication side of the desk uh, to work at the Indian Claims Commission. And that was an amazing opportunity. Uh, and that, you know, because, uh, you know, basically it looked into land claims. And what the lawyers did was they would come up with these, these you know, they're basically little history books on, on what went on back mm -hmm. then, what's happened since then, and, and, you know, then why they make the argument why this... Uh, why this First Nation should get their land claim settled or you know, dismissed. Uh, and so my job was to boil down those books into a magazine that we put out, I think every two months mm -hmm. uh, called the Landmark Magazine. And so you know, when you get involved with First Nation things, you, know, you often um, you get involved in your local stuff. And so it's very hard to get that national perspective, mm -hmm. but through uh, working at the ICC and reading all these little histories across the country that deal with land claims, I got this national perspective of, of you know, because Canada is such a huge land mass, you know, the history is different in different areas. You know, in BC, it was a matter of you stick to your valley and we'll stick to ours and, you know, and all that kind of stuff. But anyway, through all that, I, I, I started learning. And, um, and then I switched back and forth between the journalism and communication side of the the desk depending on what opportunities fell into my bowl and um and yeah i was been i've been very lucky i wanted all of our, our viewers and our listeners to know um, as we break these things up into categories and you'll hear us say that we've got some some children's books with this the books that we're talking about right now that michael has authored i tend to have a flavor for middle school and i'll make this real clear uh middle school let's take that right up to uh, our cookums and our mushrooms all the way up because the truth, we are not the strongest readers we could be. And part of that relies on, is the reason for that is for two reasons. One is because uh, books that are written by our people for our people have never existed. So for the first time in history, we want to read because there's stuff in there that we want to read, but we have to be able to read it. And so many things we can't read. And some of my, some of my very favorite authors ever, you know, um, a ragged company, 
um, uh, just some wonderful adult books uh, are not accessible. Books have to be accessible. So, so many, uh, so many parents and so many adults, you will make sure that you, you be introduced to Michael's books because they, they do it. And he's, the, the third one is now out, but they're, what he's done is he's very much layered them. So they're a fun read. They're a read almost like a, for the, the kids would read and talk about heroes. And I mean, one of the questions I got was just a riot and I'll read it to you later. But I'm um, like, can, can we do it real quickly? Uh, they're layered. So in as much as they're a fun read, the, the 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 subject matter is super, superbly interesting and important. Can you tell me just break down one by one the first the first one? Well, yeah the uh, the idea behind the books is to uh, you know in some ways educate people that First Nation people don't all think alike. So you know the books obviously the four characters are um, you know a Tim represents the physical side. He's the bi biggest muskrat. He's always hungry. You know yeah. Chickadee and Samuel. Uh, they they're kind of the, uh, the the you know they kind of split back and forth between the leader of the group, but they also sort of split go back and forth between mental and emotional kind of representation. And then Otter is always sort of the spiritual guy. Um, and so uh, so there there's sort of that sort of archetype uh, happening. But in the story themselves, there's the main mystery arc, which yeah. you know usually deals with something that that First Nation uh, are going through. Uh, but then there's also a secondary story that usually deals with those two poles of First Nation thinking. So in the first one, uh, that secondary story is about the muskrat's older cousin chains herself to the pier of a local uh, of the mine that is uh, working in their traditional territory, and she feels is is poisoning the land. And so she chains herself to the the pier. Um, and but at the same time, throughout the story, the Muskrats meet a young First Nation man who's working at the mine, who is trying to make a better life for his children by working at the mine and, and using his hands to, to earn a paycheck. And so, uh, so you meet these two poles of First Nation thinking, um, you know, and, and they're both trying to be good people. Uh, it's just that, you know, they both are in different situations and, and have to go about it in a different way uh, based on their talent, probably. And so, uh, and so, the, yeah, that's it. If, you're, if that's what you're talking about, as far as layers go, mm -hmm. uh, you know, there's those two sort of set double plots. Now in the second one, um, they go to the city, you know, many First Nation people, each, each story happens in a different season. I just finished writing the case of the rigged race, which happens in winter. The case of the missing auntie happens in the summer and many First Nations go to the city in the summer to, for whatever X or whatever fair happens in the city. And so that's what the mighty muskrats are gonna go do. And, you know, in First Nation families, or at least in my family, you know, kids of different age or of the same age are, are, are squished together. And then these ones watch these ones. And so that's basically what's happening to the mighty muskrats. And they're, you know, cousins, uh, Tim and Sam are brothers, but the, you know, Chickadee and Otter, they're all cousins. And, and, uh, and so, yeah, they go to the city and they, in the city, they meet uh, uh, a gentleman who is not doing well in the city. He's basically being assimilated into a gang. And then they meet a cousin of theirs who who has sort of left the small town life and, and has left the, the, the small town life and it's allowed him to sort of unfold himself a little bit more. Uh, and, and so you meet those two poles. And then in the third book, uh, you know, um, in some of our nations right now, there's the conversation going on of, do we bring out ceremony or do we still keep it hidden? You know, there's the fears of it being uh, mm. you know, made illegal again. There's the fears of, of people stealing it. Appropriating uh, it, of course. Uh, appropriating it or selling it in, yeah. inappropriately, thereby cheaping, cheapening it and, and making it lose credibility. Mm -hmm. So this conversation is still happening. So in the third book, there's a conversation about, um, you know, should we bring out ceremony or do we keep it hidden? Oh, that is a lot. Yeah, well, and, uh, in that book, the Cree Nation, the Cree National Gathering, I can't remember what I call it, exactly, yeah. the Cree National Assembly or something. But anyway, I call it a different name, but it's basically the Cree National Gathering. And, and it comes to uh, Windy Lake, and, uh, and that's where this conversation unfolds. And where will the fourth go? The fourth, I just finished writing it. I got to send it into my editor later today. We just finished the, uh, the first edit, I guess you can say. It's called The Case of the Rig Race. It happens in the winter. And so it is about... Um, uh, uh, yeah, this, this, there's a, the, the, they have a fur trappers festival in Windy Lake. And part of that is a dog sled race. 
and uh, you know something happens and the muskrats think that somebody's trying to mess with the race. So the muskrats are on the case of the rig race, but the two poles in that one, uh, in that one, it's, it's basically a conversation between um, you know, traditional thinking on animals and city thinking on animals. I don't, I don't know that. You know, uh, there's a no. lot of talk about worldview in this one. And I love that too. I mean, everything you said just rings bells big time. I'm, I'm from Saskatchewan. So when you said mm -hmm. that you're from a, a little place in the middle of nowhere, that's most of my province. Yeah. And, uh, and, and when you talked about the conflict, certainly on the West Coast, there's that whole where there are nations who are saying, we want to keep, we want to keep this stuff out of our eyes and others are saying we want to we want to let it in well a lot of us are making a living this way and there's there's and so it really is not it's not black and white no 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 nothing is and so you know part of it is to educate people that we we you know and uh, you know for the young first nation readers i want them to see representation i want them to see themselves represented yeah um i want them to you know see their humor and all that kind of stuff uh the the stupid jokes their parents crack and all that kind of yeah, stuff yeah, yeah. i want them to see all that stuff um and i i want them and, and then also impoverished kids you know like uh, these are often described as as indigenous hardy boy books um i grew up reading the hardy boy books i love them but um you know those kids you know they both had dirt bikes you know they just had a, a level of wealth that i didn't experience growing up and so i wanted to write books that were more you know that kids uh, of my financial status when i was growing up uh, like I said, my my parents got, you know, more wealthy as, as their careers got better. But when I was growing up um, and, um, uh, and and then also for young Canadians, I want them to have that education that we don't all think alike to see into our communities. You know, it's one thing to know about history in your head. It's another thing to bring it down to your heart. And so that's what I'm hoping I can do with these books as well. And um, and in that way, you know, make a better relationship between First Nations and Canadians. Isn't it true? It's all about education. Yeah, well, you know, I, I'm, you know, being a journalist and being a, 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 a communications person, you know, I'm asked a lot of questions, you know, like, uh, you know, will Canadians ever be Indigenous and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. And, and so, you know, these books are also an attempt to answer some of those questions or, you know, so that so that maybe, you know, in 10 years, I won't be getting them all the time. No kidding. <laughs> Listen, a question from one of your readers, and I won't say that it's Josh's son, but he said, who is your favorite muskrat? And why is it chickadee? <laughs> <laughs> I swear to God. A lot of people love chickadee. Uh, you know, I, I love them all, I guess, because they all represent, you know, to me, they're all little bits of my cousins and my brothers and my sisters. And, and your girls? Uh, not so much my girls, I guess, uh, because, yeah, just not so much my girls. Um, uh, but yeah, I guess they come more from my memory, I guess, yeah. uh, of, of, of when I was a kid. Yeah. And, uh, um, and yeah, so I, I hope that they reflect First Nation kids for sure. Can you point the finger at somebody and say that's chickadee? Uh, well, you know, chickadee is a strong, like Cree, Cree women are, are strong and oh, they're yeah. tough. Uh, they're organized, you know, they can make things happen. And, yeah. and chickadee is the seed of a strong Cree woman. <laughs> You've got to like that. Yeah, well, I come from a family of strong Cree women. So, so, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. You know, uh, if they don't see representation, they're going to uh, strong Cree woman me. And I've got to say, for, for all of you teachers out there that have been watching and listening to Michael, being a writer is nothing more than being a storyteller. And when you hear Michael talk, all he's done in his books is he's written those ideas through characters and he's put them in it's everything that you that you're saying now you can read them they're, they're all there it's all there in spirit in otter yes <laughs> in spirit in otter form is yeah there, um and you can also see uh, teachers and educators uh, and parents for that matter you can see behind mike uh, michael you can see the three books his three books are there and um th when i say there's there's room for them in our libraries, there's 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 not a library in Canada that should be without them. Uh, the Hardy Boys, if you want to call them the Hardy Boys, although in fairness, I have to tell you that I didn't have the skills to read the Hardy Boys because I'm severely dyslexic and I have long-range memory issues, and I struggled. And when I watched my friends read the Hardy Boys, it, it, it killed me that I couldn't do that. Mm. This is different. 
this is different because as a, as a Métis man, I look and I say, this is my cookum. This is my grandma. My, my Nokomis is right there. And I would want to read because I see myself in these lines. So if you're working with, with First Nations or Métis or Inuit in children, understand that this, we find themselves in their books. They're going to want to read these books. And non-Indigenous people should read them because the spirit of, of, of who we are as Indigenous people just, just exalts through it from every, every page. This is the coolest thing ever. Well, uh, I appreciate the, uh, I appreciate you saying that. That's awesome to hear. It's true too, isn't it, Michael? Oh, well, I, you know, uh, <laughs> you, you hope on this, uh, as the writer, that, that that's what the audience is experiencing, I guess. I'll put it, it that absolutely way. is. Can I ask you about your girls? How old are the girls? Uh, they're, you know, just becoming teenagers and they're, uh, you know, they are, uh, they make my world go round, you know, uh, that's one of the great things about having kids is seeing the world through new eyes. And, no and, and, and that happens again at each stage of their life. And so, uh, you know, the, uh, the um, trailer for Stranger Things, uh, the fourth season has just coming out. And so I love sitting down and watching that with them because it happened when I was 15, you know, and so, uh, uh, you know, or what, you know, the, the past seasons have happened when I was in the early 80s. And so uh, I can talk to them uh, you know, about, you know, well, this is why that was happening, or this was cool back then, or this is what we did, you know, we, we didn't have phones, <laughs> and we didn't Isn't sit there a, like this. All yeah, yeah, no kidding. Yeah. Uh, Michael, without any further ado, um, let, let's be real clear. I'm a big, big fan of what you're doing for a thousand reasons. And the, the main was, I, I believe that our kids deserve to be able to read, not just so they can succeed in this ridiculous schooling system that doesn't recognize children for their own gifts, but mm -hmm. they have to achieve based on some norm that comes from wherever. But the, the real, the, it's the ability to travel, you know, come on, come, come with me. And when you and I are here, by the way, just so you know, because of my, my learning disability, I listen to books. And last year, I listened to 100 okay. books on audible.com. Wow. I know, 100 books. And right now, Sharon K. Penman has got me right, right in the middle of the plague in the UK. And these guys are coming with these big raven masks, and they're the doctors. And I just love getting away through stories. And our kids deserve that. And For sure. And the only way they can get there is to become readers and anybody can become a reader. You don't have to, anybody can learn to walk. Anybody can learn to, you know, you'll have different levels of reading, but mm -hmm. they deserve to it. And what you've done is you've said, Hey, come on, you can see yourselves in these books. They're not all that difficult. Let, let's do this together. Teachers reading with your kids or come on, Michael, give us a bit of a reading. Let us hear sure. your characters through your, your soul. Okay. Well, uh, this is um, sort of, about halfway through the case of the Burgle Bundle, chapter five, and what's happening uh, is the uh, Cree gathering is going on. And so the muskrats are asked to give out, or at least a few of the muskrats are asked to give out stew. Um, okay. Ch Chickadee tiptoed through the crowd to help her cousin. Sam was happy when she took the ladle that had been clanking along the side of the cast iron cauldron. Thank you, he whispered to his cousin. Chickadee giggled. Do you think I'd trust the, ha ha uh, the hard work to just you boys? She smiled. Did you see Otter? She lip pointed in Grandpa's direction. They all turned. Otter was leaning to one side so he could watch them. He waved when they turned to look. His cousins just nodded and beamed. They had work to do in full hands. Once they got to the space where the fire would have been, Sam and Atim went clockwise to get to the elders. Tim presented his portable shelf of bowls to the first woman in the front row. She took an empty bowl and put it in her lap. Following tightly behind a Tim, Chickadee took the lid off Sam's cauldron and filled the ladle with stew. From her chair, the elderly woman held out her bowl. With a smile and a smattering of small talk, Chickadee filled it. When the muskrats went to move on, the elder's brow furrowed. No, no bannock? Chickadee raised her eyebrow and looked at Sam. Sam's eyes grew large. Don't look at me. Mavis had to run back to the house to aunt for the ban bannock. She said she forgot it. Chickadee shook her head. Ever not cool. Her face became the picture of disappointment as she turned to the lady. No, I'm sorry, Elder. They forgot it back at the kitchen. So you're giving me stew with no bannock? The old lady's eyebrow arched like she was a Vulcan haggling over a bowl of soup. Chickadee nodded, a large frown on her cheeks. The Elder tapped Chickadee's hand. It's okay. Don't worry about it. Bring me some bannock when it gets here. Chickadee smiled at her, said goodbye, and moved on. With one old woman satisfied, they all took a few steps around the circle to the woman's husband. This is going to take a while, Sam thought, his arms beginning to complain about their load. Changing strategy, he put the cauldron down and ferried bowls between the elders and Chickadee. Once two rows of elders had been fed, the muskrats gathered for a quick conversation. 
This is taking so long. Tim threw his hands in the air. Sam rattled the ladle in the cauldron. We barely going to get through the pipe carriers with what's left. Where's the rest? Chickadee's large eyes were filled with alarm. But Tim studied the crowd and spoke almost absentmindedly. Mavis went to get the bannock. She must be bringing more stew too. Holy, I hope so. They're going to eat us. Chickadee looked around at the people waiting for food. The three of them laughed. Muskrat stew is good, but Tim snickered. Cannibal, Sam punched his brother's arm. He looked over at Grandpa. Their elder was staring back at them expectantly. Ah, uh, we better get moving. Grandpa's given us me the look. The muskrats crossed to the other side of the teepee to feed the pipe carriers. The stone and wood pipes sat in front of their owners in carved wood cradles that held them upright. The long pipe stems pointed out in a fan, but the different colored soapstone heads were clustered fairly close together within easy reach for their owners or their assistants to fill them. Sam was realizing he should have been at the back of the stew parade, but instead he was leading. He wanted to go behind the old men, but the first two were waving vigorously for him to hurry over. The path between the pipe carriers and their pipes was a thin thread. Sam gulped. The first two waved their hands, insisting he come along. Unable to put down his load in the tight space, Sam walked forward slowly, holding the cauldron to one side. Chickadee would still be able to ladle out stew. Where's the bannock? The muskrats groaned. With the first two old men fed, Samuel continued to edge forward, unable to see his feet on his right side. He wanted to slip past Grandpa and the old man beside him. But when Chickadee got to his grandfather, she pulled on Sam's sleeve for him to stop. His cousin's tug pulled Samuel off balance. In slow motion, he took one step towards the weight of the cauldron. He winced as he heard a series of clinks like dominoes falling over. A prickly heat spread across his face. Sam looked over at the pipe carriers. The old man closest to him was tall and didn't have to look up much to meet Sam's eye, even from his sitting position on the grass. His eyes burned red. All the pipe carriers glared at him, including his grandfather. With more of the precious little strength left in his arm, Sam moved the cauldron over so he could look down. The fan of the pipe stems were akimbo, and the thin space that had once separated each pipe head had been collapsed by the push of his shoe. Sam's mouth hung open in shock. He stammered an apology and moved forward quickly. He told himself so the carriers could straighten out their pipes without him in the way. Finding a spot where he could stand and not hit anything sacred, he held the cauldron so his cousins could easily fill more bowls. Sam rubbed his forehead in consternation. He couldn't believe he had hit the pipes with his foot. If only Chickadee hadn't pulled his sleeve. <laughs> Okay, very, very quickly. For the teachers and educators among you, there is a plethora of culture, what you just heard. And just from the little things, you've got to know that the stew is what happens. When there's a gathering, stew, 90% of the time. And more often than not, it's stuff that I don't like because it's stringy and there's a lot of fat in it <laughs> either way. And then the, the lip pointing, for those who didn't pick it up, it just, it's just subtly came through and it's just part of that cultural thing that you pick up. And then he kind of went from there to the fact that the elders will eat first. The bannock is always part of it. And it's usually margarine that's on the side or some sort of a jam. Yeah. It was just a plethora of culture in a fun, exciting way. I hope they make you do an audio version of that. Uh, well, we do have an audio version, actually. And it was written by uh, or, or done by Ganethea Horn. Um, yeah. She is in Letterkenny. Uh, she is, uh, what else is she in? Uh, she's... Well, she's in a bunch of stuff uh, recently. She's a, she's a great all, actress. Of all three? Yeah, she's there's audiobooks of all three of the current books uh, done by Gana Thiel. And, and uh, she uh, is a Mohawk from Six Nations, I believe. She's Mohawk? Yeah. Oh, she, Okay. Uh, when I say thank you, I mean a real sincere thank you. What a pleasure it's been. Are you Cheers. in Winnipeg? Yeah, right. I am. Yep, yep. I'm. Uh, I'm. I worked this morning, so I was up at uh, three a.m. and uh, I just got off work at noon, and so I'm probably gonna go have a little nap now. And, and your hockey team's doing well. Yes. Yeah. The uh, Jets. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. It's been really nice talking to you. Here's Cheers. A have mile. a good one, David. Bye. Thanks. Bye bye. Okay. Well, thank you all. Um, please remember to buy all of your Indigenous books, resources from Good Minds Books. Uh, Good Minds is 100% Indigenous owned and offer 5,000 curated titles for young and for old, including Mighty Muscat series that you just heard about. So if you're looking for it, that's the place to get it. You can save $10 on your next purchase of the books by using the promo code 13 moons, 13 reads. So if you're looking for the Mighty Muscats book, for heaven's sakes, use the code, save that money at checkout. Uh, and if you'd like to win a copy of the uh, Mighty Muscat tr trilogy, all you have to do is subscribe to our YouTube channel and comment on this particular video and there'll be one series out. And next month we will be celebrating the Agoti Noi, 
which is Frozen Moon, with the author and First Nations consultant of the Southern Ontario Library Service, Nancy Cooper. That will be fun. Nancy has authored a great dual language story, The Trading Tree, which I can't wait to discuss with you. And until then, be safe, take care of each other, and then uh, I'll see you then.